You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and welcome to episode 13 of the Crisis in the Church series. We're joined again by Father Paul Robinson, the prior of St. Isidore's in Denver, Colorado. Last episode, we saw how modernists have changed our interpretation of the scripture, the sacraments, the catechism, the liturgy, and the priesthood. Today, we will compare side by side the viewpoints of modern popes and examine them in the light of Pope St. Pius X's encyclical, Pascendi. Within the span of 30 minutes, we'll see how the modern church has perfectly followed the modernist playbook that Pope St. Pius X had predicted just 100 years before. Nearly every modern pronouncement from the Vatican has been perfectly predictable. If you'd like to learn more about this series we're doing on the crisis in the church, or go back and revisit our previous 12 episodes, or if you want to support this project, please visit sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Now, we'll turn to Father Robinson. Well, welcome back to the SSPX podcast and the next episode of our Crisis in the Church series. And yes. and we started out with Father uh, with Father Franks. He gave us some of the history of modernism, uh, talking about Tyrell, Blondell. Uh, and then you talked about um, Pascendi. You talked about the kind of the history and, and you know, where modernism started and, and where it got us. And today we're going to do something a little bit different, and that is uh, kind of showing how modernism really has uh, infiltrated uh, the church in terms of the hierarchy, the clergy, the popes, by showcasing, maybe showcasing is a bad word, but by showing, by by passing along some quotes, some quotations, and some statements that have been given uh, by the modern church that really again, shows how modernism has infected the church. Yes. Um, so I, I think, in, you know, in those first couple of conferences, uh, we, we talked about Pescendi, that we were mainly focusing on that text of, of Pescendi. Um, and I think we made a few applications to the modern church. But I, I think it would be helpful for us to go back over uh, those parts of Pescendi, uh, the, the particular ideas of the modernists, and then apply them to um, quotations that are actual words of, of modern prelates and, and see how modernism is is very modern. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, you think that oh, if you look at an encyclical from 1907, it's like, how is that relevant today? Well, it's in fact very relevant because that, that sort of paradigm or blueprint for, for modernism that um, Pius X laid out in Pescendi is still hits the bullseye even today, which is okay. really stunning. It hasn't gone away. It's very much a real thing. It's still with us today. So I guess we can start by looking at uh, the sense of agnosticism, the sense of, of separation uh, from a belief in, in God uh, that has uh, become really a part of, that has that is part of modernism, not that it has become, uh, but the sense of agnosticism that is part of modernism. Uh, so how do we how do we see that that agnosticism coming to light in modernism? Yeah, so that, that agnosticism, which uh, St. Pius X says is the essential characteristic of modernism, in the sense that um, they are agnostic about any evidence for the existence of God that comes from outside the mind, um, that any, any information you receive from outside the mind about God, like uh, various motives of credibility or revelation of, um, in, um, that that's, uh, comes from an authority, they, they would say, yeah, we, that's not conclusive to prove that God exists or the true religion exists. And, I mean, for this, I think we can see this <clears throat> somewhat in Pope Francis. In one of his famous uh, interviews with Eugenio Scafari, you know, Eugenio Scafari is this editor of La Repubblica in Italy. Um, I think he's an apostate from, from the faith. He's an atheist. Yeah. Uh, he's in, I think he's in his 90s or his eight, late 80s. Um, and and he has I, I, for for whatever reason it, I, I I have no idea I hope somebody knows somewhere but but Pope Francis likes to have interviews with him yeah. um, and Scafari doesn't bring um, a, a recording device uh, or or anything um, he doesn't bring a notepad I, they just chat and then Scafari recreates the interview afterwards and the Vatican has never sort of drawn back from from what Scafari has reported. So one of the first ones, um, Scalfari said, uh, Your Holiness, is there a single vision of the good and who decides what it is? And Pope Francis, he says, each of us has a vision of good and of evil. We have to encourage people to move towards what they think is good. Hmm. Um, and, and then 
Scoffar asks a, another question, and, and Pope Francis says, I repeat it. Everyone has his own idea of good and evil and must choose to follow the good and fight evil as he conceives them. That would be enough to make the world a better place. So, okay. yeah, when, when you s say that, that the notion of good and evil is purely subjective, that, that it just really uh, is up to each individual person to determine for themselves what is good and evil, um, then you're saying that there's no objective evidence outside of you to, to, to tell you what is the way to go, um, that there's a God and he sets laws, for instance, and you must follow those laws and so on. So I, I think what really what Pope Francis is, is doing there is he's reducing all religion to a purely subject, subjective thing. Um, and that, that flows directly from the agnosticism of, of the modernists. And it's, um, it's somewhat frightening because we all know that from our catechism that you, you, uh, your conscience is not just an infallible rule for what is good and what is evil. I mean, that's what Pope Francis is advising. Just follow your conscience. Right. Um, but we, we know rather that you have to form the right conscience. You know, the different types of consciences. There's the lax conscience. There's a the tender conscience. There's a the scrupulous conscience. There's the erroneous conscience. Um, and, and the Pope is here. Just, you know, just follow what, what feels right for you. Um, and that, that's really the heart of modernism. You, you follow what feels right to you, and you think that that is, in fact, what God is directing you. you. You say, God's directing me to do this. I'm, I'm no moral theologian, uh, but I have been listening to this podcast. So, um, <laughs> and, it seems, <laughs> uh, and it seems to me like this is very much a, a, an elementary position um, that any Catholic should not take. Uh, I think I'm looking back at our sheet here. This is, I think, episode three. We talked about this with Father Wiseman when we talked about Kant and the break with realism and how, how this, this idea that I can't, I, I don't necessarily want to know what is out there. I project my own idea on what is out there. There's no correlation between the two. And this is exactly what Pope Francis is doing. He's saying, well, whatever this person believes to be true, therefore is true. This is, this is cut and paste from, from Kant. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And next let's, I guess, look at, um, religious sense and religious experience. Um, how does that play out in modernist philosophy? So when they, when they um, say you can't get evidence of God from outside of your mind, they reduce all, everything to that subjective movement. And then they, they say that you can kind of develop a sense of God, that you have this longing for God. And in certain situations that that longing for God can be triggered. And this leads them to to say that effectively, whenever you find any religious movement in any person in the world, it's really God who's who's moving them. Uh, it's a mm. movement of God. Whereas before, we would say no, it's only God um, if they're headed in the right path. They're headed towards the objective good. Um, so they basically bless or approve of all religions, any any sort of religious sense of any person. So here's a quote from Pope John Paul II in his book, Sign of Contradiction. He says, this God is professed in his silence by the Trappist and the Kamaldolite. Um, these are Catholic orders, you know, Catholic monks. Okay. And it's to him that the desert Bedouin turns at his hour of prayer. And perhaps the Buddhist too, wrapped in contempla contemplation as he purifies his thought, preparing the way for nirvana. God in his absolute transcendence, God who transcends absolutely the whole of creation, all that is visible and comprehensible. So he looks at the Trappist and, and he looks at the, the, the Bedouin and he looks at the Buddhists and they're all praying. And then he, he concludes that if they're praying, if they have this religious movement in them, it must be God working in them. And they're all turning towards God mm. um, because they're having the subjective religious experience. I, as, as you were saying that, Father, you, you ended it by saying, God who transcends the whole of creation. I was waiting for you to finish with God who transcends even his church. Like that would be the logical way for Pope John Paul II to end that statement, because that's what he's basically saying. You know, God created this church. He, he left us the church. Therefore, he transcends even that. You don't even need to follow that it, it, because you could, you could do anything. Well, I mean, God can definitely move people outside of the Catholic faith, um, but he's not sure. going to move them 
through the Buddhist religion. He's not going to move them through the Bedouin, so it's whatever religion the Bedouins are, are practicing, <laughs> right. you know, um, Muslim, Islam, or, or whatever. Those religions are, are false. So we can objectively judge them as having a false prayer. They're mm-hmm. praying the wrong way. I mean, uh, the, the fact that he mentions nirvana just blows my mind because right. nirvana is is stepping away from reality. It's not trying to move towards reality. It's trying to move towards nothingness, uh, which is the opposite of God. Right. And this is Pope John Paul II, that, that quote. Uh, and, and we have very similar quotes from, from Pope Francis. I mean, he was the, the bishop of, of Argentina. Uh, so he was very familiar with Amazonian cultures. And, you know, that Amazon synod that we saw, there was a ton of that same sort of uh, religious experience, religious feeling from native cultures in, in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in Pope Francis, what you see in like Laudato Si and and this Pan Amazonian Synod um, is a, a certain <clears throat> um, sort of romanticization of nature. That somehow nature just triggers this religious sense. I think when we had our um, conferences or our podcasts on, on modernism, we're talking about how if you see a sunset and you're just like moved or you yeah. see a nice, beautiful rose, you're, you're moved. Well, Pope Francis, he looks at nature and he looks at the like these cultures, like the Amazonian cultures. You wonder why would he focus upon that? Because he sees them um, in sort of man's pure state. As, as having this access to God through nature. Uh, let, me, let me just quote this working document for the Pan-Amazonian Synod. Um, he says, In the Amazon, life is inserted to, linked with, and integrated in territory. This vital and nourishing physical space provides the possibility, sustenance, and limit of life. Furthermore, we can say that the Amazon is not only aware but also a what, a place of meaning for faith or the experience of God in history. Thus, territory is a theological place where faith is lived and also a particular source of God's relation. So just by the fact that you're in a place and you're experiencing nature, you're experiencing God. Um, whenever you come into contact with with these things, it's um, he he goes on to say that that um, in the Amazon the caresses of God become manifest and become incarnate in history. Um, that that the, the the people are kind of being led to God just by living in a space and interacting with nature. So it's, it's kind of a deification of nature. Yeah. Um, just north of me, I'm, I'm here in Phoenix, just north of me, there's Sedona. And there's, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Sedona. It's I a very am, mystic, am. mystical the place. Crystals. There's all these crystals around and there's these vortexes where supposedly you can feel vibrations from the earth. Um, <laughs> so instead of going to Our Lady of Sorrows uh, Chapel here in Phoenix, I'm just going to go up to the vortexes and hang out and feel the vibrations. And that will be my communion with God. It's a territorial right? <laughs> space. It's, it's, it's a territory, okay. it's a theological place where your faith can be lived, you know? Perfect. Um, just... <laughs> Get get your get your your bandana on and uh, <laughs> your bell bottoms or, or whatever and yeah yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, so I, from then from there we we look at how modernism takes a look at history, takes a look at at even the miracles of of our Lord, takes a look at at the his, historicity of the church. Yes, so um, we said that. That the the modernists, because they have this impression that faith is something purely internal, uh, what they do when they have a religious experience um, is is they they interpret it and and project that experience onto the reality outside of them. Um, so they the faith comes from within their emotions, and then they project it on the outside reality, and this leads the modernists. To reinterpret what happened in the Gospels, they they end up saying <clears throat> that the apostles were stirred to a religious experience by our Lord, and that they sort of deified him as a result. They they had they they was like, wow, he stirs my religious feelings so much that maybe he's God. He must be God. I'm going to project upon him that he's God. Um, so in the mind of the modernists, the miracles, did, even the miracles did not really happen, that uh, the, it was just a fruit of those religious emotions. Mm. Um, so it's famously Cardinal Casper, or I should say infamously, Cardinal Casper was is one of the ones who's, who's always uh, talking about this 
this idea that what happened in the Gospels is is reported in the Gospels is not really the reporting of actual events. It's just reporting of the apostles' religious sense and, and their projection of, of their religious feelings upon the reality outside of them. Mm. So he says— in his book, Jesus the Christ, we must count as legendary many of the stories of the miracles contained in the Gospels. In these legends, one must seek not so much their historical context as their theological aim. So, I mean, he, he's, he's, trying, <laughs> he's trying to say, oh, you know, I mean, we, there's still value there. It didn't really happen, but there's still value there. Um, he goes on. A number of miracle stories turn out in the light of form criticism. This is a way of interpreting the Bible to be projections of the experiences of Easter back into the earthly life of Jesus or anticipatory representations of the exalted Christ. Um, among these epiphany stories, we would probably include the stilling of the storm, the transfiguration, Jesus is walking on the lake, the feeding of the four or five thousand and the miraculous draft of fishes. So it's just um they're, they're projecting their impressions of our Lord uh, back on previous events. They didn't really happen. They're just sort of overinflated by all the religious emotions that they're having with regards to our Lord. Um, I think when we had, you know, our, our, our conference about that, how, how I said that, that um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it would be ridiculous for, for anybody to behave in this way. I mean, we're making the apostles to be out these these very emotional, um, sappy, uh, hallucinatory men. Right. <laughs> when in right. fact, they they seem to be the most common sense uh, men uh, around, you know, very common sense people. And we've talked to you and Father, you and I have talked about this outside of, of this crisis in the church series. We talked about it on some of the questions with Father uh, podcast episodes, you know, talking about these miracles. And, and we talked about at length how, you know, we, we don't know how miracles happen. We, we do know that they are outside of the realm of us being able to explain it scientifically. Um, but beyond that, we, we don't know. So for, for the, a, a cardinal of the church to say that this is just a hallucination that a man had, that's, that's an astounding thing. It's astonishing. It's really wow. astonishing. Yeah, it just empties out the whole faith. There's nothing left. Wow. Um, was Cardinal Casper, was he just kind of one of these one-off? Was this like a one-off quote or are there? No, I, it can be found in others. I mean, even someone so conservative as Cardinal Mueller, um, wow. he, um, he says in his, in his book, Catholic Dogma, again, commenting on the resurrection, he says a running camera would not have been able to make an audiovisual recording of either the Easter manifestations of Jesus in front of his disciples, nor of the resurrection event, which at its core is the consummation of the personal relation of the Father to the incarnate Son in the Holy Ghost. Um, like, like somehow you wouldn't be able to observe the, the manifestations of our, of our Lord to his disciples after the resurrection like it, it happened purely internally in 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 their in their mind or, or again their 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 religious sense or whatever it is, um, yeah. So so that's I, it. Just empties the historical reality of the things that are reported in the Gospels. Right. And I guess the next logical step then to take, if if you're a modernist, is you know we talked about how you know anyone's anyone's convictions, anyone's conscience can be uh, equally valid. And that's how we get into this whole realm of ecumenism being a, really a core tenet of, of modernism. Yeah, so, I mean, Pashindi d- does go on to um, to what we were talking about previously, that the, the fact that uh, you, if you have this viewpoint of agnosticism, you have to start looking at religious experiences around the world and, and think that they all come ultimately from God, um, that they're, they're all good. So there is um, this notion— with Vatican II and the post-Vatican II world, um, that all religions, in fact, lead to salvation. If they're all being moved by God, if, if the religious sense that is working in all these different religions, in fact, comes from God, then God must be leading them to salvation, even through those false religions, what we used to call false religions. Okay. So there's there's a Vatican II document, Unitatis Redintegratio, 
uh, it says, these separated churches and communities, though we believe they suffer from defects, they have by no means been deprived of significance and importance in the mystery of salvation. For the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as means of salvation. Mm. And this is totally contrary to what the church has always taught. We have always taught that a person can be saved in a non-Catholic religion, but only in spite of that religion. The religion as self, as it, as it is in itself, it leads to damnation, in fact. Um, but the, the, the person might be led by God in spite of that religion towards salvation um, through things like baptism of desire. But Unitatis Redintegratio is saying that these religions in themselves lead to salvation, though they're defective in some ways. They are a means of salvation. It says that in the text. They are a means of salvation. That means that they have some quality inherent in them that can lead you to salvation when we know that that's not the case at all. No, it's not. It's not. Um, they're headed the wrong, the wrong direction. They have the wrong dogmas. So um, then, of course, it was John Paul II who, who really graphically portrayed before the whole world in, in, in uh, 1986 this idea. He incarnated this idea in his Assisi meetings that were uh, repeated by Benedict XVI and also by, by Pope Francis. But Pope John Paul II, he's commenting on the Assisi event, and he says, the event of Assisi can be considered as a visible illustration, an object lesson, a catechesis understandable by all of the presuppositions and significations of our commitment to the ecumenism and interreligious dialogue recommended and promoted by the Second Vatican Council. All authentic prayer is inspired by the Holy Ghost, who is mysteriously present in the heart of every man. So, so that's, I think, a very explicit ex assertion of this idea that whenever anybody is praying anywhere, it's really from the one God. Um, hmm. That all, all religious prayer, all religious manifestations anywhere must be from, from God. Um, whereas in the past, we would say, no, no, that's not the case. It's definitely right. not the case. And similar to what we did in, in the last section, you know, we can look at then the uh, Pope Francis is is picking up that that torch and, and carrying it full full heartedly. Absolutely, absolutely. So for for Pope Francis, he almost takes it to the next level. Um, okay. Because for him, ecumenism is is not just about uh, respecting what other people how they do religion. Um, we respect it because. They, we believe that that's under the guidance of God as well. Um, that, that's why they respect it, the modernists respect it. But he also draws the conclusion that we must not try to convert them. Um, it, it, it would be wrong to convert. If, if God is working in these other religions, then we must not convert them. You've probably heard, I think we've all heard these, these quotes that he has repeated time and again, where he condemns proselytism, this effort to, to convert others. So here's, here's what, what he says um, in 2016. He says, never fight. Let the theologians study the abstract realities of theology. But what should I do with a friend, a neighbor, an orthodox? Be open. Be a friend. But should I make efforts to convert him or her? There is a very, there is a very grave sin against ecumenism, proselytism. We should never proselytize the orthodox. Like you should, you should never try to bring them into the Catholic faith. Um, it's I mean, really striking that he says that this is a very grave sin against ecumenism, as if ecumenism in and of itself is a, is a, is a religion handed down by God. That is a very striking statement. It's like wow. a sin against ecumenism? Well, what about, I thought we were just trying to please God, not ecumenism. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, on, a, on another occasion, he said, you must be consistent with your faith. Um, it never occurred to me, and nor should it, to say to a boy or a girl, you are Jewish, you are Muslim, come, be converted. You be consistent with your faith, and that consistency is what will make you mature. We are not living in the times of the Crusades. The last thing I should do is try to convince an unbeliever. Never. Um, so it's, it's really astonishing um, and, and shows that there's this, this diametrically different mentality on 
the truth and on the path uh, to God. Uh, for, for Pope Francis, all these paths, they lead to God. All these religions lead to God. And if you follow your sense of the good and what's right, you follow your own notion of God, then, then you will save your soul. Um, so then what is the point of St. Francis Xavier? What is the point of um, all these priests, bishops who have tried to convert uh, and bring people closer to God? That is pointless. There's, there's no reason. Yeah, and I, I think that that brings us to 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 the the, the next thing that Pashini talks about, and that that's the evolution of dogma in the sense of um, how can then we justify? I mean, he's he's basically condemning the Crusades, right? In that quote, right. he's saying, "But well, we're not in the time of the Crusades." Well, I, well, wait a second. I thought the Crusades were Catholic. Um, yeah. So how can we say we're Catholic today when in the past they they believe so differently? Um, so I think that's something that Pashini covers as well. Right. And, and evolution of dogma, we're going to be talking about this, I think in the next section, if, if I have my schedule correct, uh, and yes. that is existentialism. Yes. When we're talking, we'll be talking with Father Bormeau about ex- existentialism and, and he'll go into a lot of detail about this evolution of dogma. Uh, and I know this because we've already recorded it. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but this is, but this is something that's in, that's inherent in modernism. Totally. Definitely inherent in modernism, and, and and why when we when we see uh, Pope Francis especially not concerned that he knows that what he's teaching is contrary to past teaching in the church, but this doesn't concern him because uh, the modernists believe that dogma has to change over time, that we have to have it correspond to our religious sense, the religious sense of the people of of the modern day. So the famous example um, is. Pope Francis condemning the the death penalty. Um, mm-hmm. Here's here's a quote from just last year, 2019. He says, "The way to understand the faith today after Vatican II is different than the way of understanding the faith before Vatican II. Why? Because there is a development of knowledge. For example, the the very nature of moral conscience. Today, I said clearly." that the death penalty is not acceptable, it's immoral. But 50 years ago, no. Did the church change? No. Moral conscience has developed, a development. So somehow Mm -hmm. he wants to say uh, that we have a different understanding of the faith before Vatican II and after Vatican II, and it's completely contrary <laughs> to the way we understood it before, um, but it's not a changing of the church. Um, it's just a development. It's just an evolution of dogma. Um, but we would be like, wait a second. I mean, an evolution, you, you've got to have uh, an organic growing. It can't be completely the opposite of what, that's not an evolution. That's a complete break um, right. with, with the dogma. So, I mean, I, I guess if you adhere to this skewed logic of of modernism, where earlier we were talking about how conscience is the is the final arbiter of what is true and what is not true, this can make sense um, because, well, my conscience now, fifty years later, says that the death penalty is immoral. So, okay, therefore, in Pope Francis' mind, this probably makes sense. But the issue is, your premise is flawed, Holy Father. It's the conscience is not the uh, main point of of salvation of of your soul. Yeah, I, I think if any of us lived and made all our decisions based on our changing emotions, right. um, which effectively is what the religious sense is, then we would be contradicting ourselves all the time. I mean, the only way we we live a consistent life um, throughout the course of of however many years we live is because we have certain ideas and principles that we adhere to, no matter what we're feeling, you know, right. in our gut. Right. <laughs> but right. but when you throw that out and you just say, oh, just follow the religious sense, just follow your 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 conscience, your sense of the good or or, or the evil, um, then you're going to have a, a life where you're changing all the time. Absolutely. Well, Father, this this really helped to clarify, crystallize the fact that you know, in their own words, these th- th- this is modernism in action. This is not just the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth or a bunch of rad trads out there saying that uh, that modernism is in the church. It is. That's there. They are. They are uh, communicating it to us every day. Yeah, there's a direct link between the textbook modernism and, and what we're seeing in, in the modern church, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and that just uh, goes all the more to show that we are definitely in uh, a major crisis in the church. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, Father, thank you for taking the time to go through this with us. And uh, we look forward to having you on for another episode very soon. I think you are next scheduled for uh, uh, a conference on the Nova Sordo Mass, but that'll be in eight or nine weeks or so. Sounds good, Andrew. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Very good. Thanks, Father. Thank you for listening to and watching episode 13 of our Crisis in the Church series here on the SSPX podcast. In episode 14, we're going to be welcoming back Father John McFarland as we close out our study of modernism by looking at what the Catholic Church has to say about the French Revolution's trinity, that of liberty, equality, and fraternity. And we'll see if the Church has changed in its viewpoint on this idea over the last century. If you have a question on the topic of the crisis, please feel free to ask it at sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Please share this episode with someone who you think might enjoy it. And if they don't know what a podcast is, please show them so that they can take advantage of all our episodes. And finally, if you have the ability to set up a monthly recurring donation of 5 or 10 or $20 on sspxpodcast.com, it would help us immensely to complete this crisis in the church project. Until next week, thank you for listening and God bless you.